We know that occultists like to do their talking through symbols, so we only have to look at those surrounding the new Europe to see evidence of what it truly represents. At the moment there are two European Parliament buildings, one in Brussels, Belgium, and a more recent construction in Strasbourg, France. This is a picture of the one in Strasbourg, which has deliberately been built to symbolise the unfinished Tower of Babel. Now why is it circular and not a ziggurat or pyramid shape? Well, they based the design on this painting by a 16th century artist, Peter Bruegel. So although the painting is inaccurate and consequently the design of the building is inaccurate, the intent behind it is clear to see. This is the poster that announced the completion of the Strasbourg Tower in 1999. As you can see, they didn't even try to hide the fact that it was based on the Tower of Babel, as they used a representation of the original painting in the poster, rather than a photo of the actual building. This poster was actually banned after it caused so much controversy. The slogan at the bottom right reads, Many tongues, one voice. Remember that God scattered people with different languages to stop them constructing their satanic system and their satanic tower. Well, here they explicitly reveal the intention to reverse what God did at the original Tower of Babel and to reconvene in unified defiance of God. It has taken several millennia for Satan to achieve this reversal, but in modern-day Europe, and indeed in the whole world, there is now a dominant international language of English that the vast majority understand. This allows cooperation between nations that had been impossible since Genesis 11. You may also notice that there are 12 stars around the top of the tower in the poster. The EU flag is a circle of 12 stars, but notice that these particular stars are inverted. We know that inverted pentagrams represent Satan as the horned god Baphomet. So we have openly satanic symbols not only alongside, but encircling and hovering over the new parliament building. This is symbolic of Satan's position of authority in the European system. Here is the actual EU flag. The European flag was itself designed by a devout Catholic, Arsene Heights, who was inspired by the halo of twelve stars that often encircles Mary's head in Catholic pictures. Pope John Paul dedicated the continent of Europe to Mary, and his successor, Pope Benedict XVI, made the unification of Europe under Mary's Catholicism the primary goal of his papacy. Because the Catholic Mary is none other than the ancient demonic deity Asherah, they were dedicating the European Union to her spiritual rule. One thing I've also noticed recently about the EU flag is that they've started stylizing it into an all-seeing eye symbol at various events. The circle of stars becomes the centre of the eye, and the lines above and below act as the lids. The national anthem for the European Union is Ode to Joy. The lyrics were written by Friedrich Schiller, and the poetic translation of the German goes as follows. Joyful spark of hope and glory, unity with the divine. Drunken under fire, goddess, we approach thy holy shrine. Thy magic shall unite forever those nations which were not. Every mortal becomes one, and your rule shall not be forgot. So the national anthem of Europe is therefore an anthem to Asherah that talks about bringing everyone into unity with the divine so that we may become as gods ourselves. It talks about entering the shrine of the pagan goddess with drunkenness and being united by the power of magic and fire. This is deeply wicked stuff. Within the main chamber of the Strasbourg unfinished tower building there are 679 seats. They have all been filled except one which currently lies empty, the 666th one. And now to the crux of the matter. One of the first things I did in the series was to draw a line from Genesis 11 that talked about a literal Babylon to Revelation 17 that talked about mystery Babylon as the mother of all prostitutes, the fountainhead of evil. My goal throughout this whole series in a way has been to show the link between those two points. So we can now go to Revelation 17 and it should start to make a lot of sense. Come with me, he said, and I will show you the judgment that is going to come on the great prostitute who rules over many waters. The kings of the world have committed adultery with her, and the people who belong to this world have been made drunk by the wine of her immorality. So the angel took me in the spirit into the wilderness. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that had seven heads and ten horns, and blasphemies against God were written all over it. The woman wore purple and scarlet clothing and beautiful jewellery made of gold and precious gems and pearls. 
In her hand she held a gold goblet full of obscenities and the impurities of her immorality. A mysterious name was written on her forehead, Babylon the Great, mother of all prostitutes and obscenities in the world. I could see that she was drunk, drunk with the blood of God's holy people who were witnesses for Jesus. I stared at her in complete amazement. The woman, as we know, is the goddess who is the embodiment of this false religious system that started back in Babylon, the same false mystery religion we've been following throughout all history in this series. Continuously throughout that time, the same goddess has kept popping up in the background, under the name of Samiramis, or Asherah, or Jezebel, or Mary, or the goddess of reason. This evil system is the source of all obscenities in the world. We've seen that. How what started in Babylon has flowed down through history, creating all false religions and polluting people with evil ideas causing oppression, death and misery by various means. Revelation tells us she is drunk with the blood of God's holy people. We've seen that too. We saw what she did to true Christians through Catholicism and through the Jesuits and through the French Revolution to name just a few examples. She killed anyone who got in her way. Now what does Revelation 17 say she rides in on? What is she paired with or connected to? The beast she is riding matches the description of the beast from Revelation 13 and Daniel 7, the end time empire of iron and clay. This new world order, amalgamation of all the previous world empires centred in Europe. It has the same description, seven heads and ten horns and blasphemies written all over it. So the woman or prostitute represents the false mystery religion. The beast that she rides in on represents the false political or temporal system. And this is a picture of what Semiramis did with Nimrod back in Babylon. Remember that Semiramis was primarily the religious figurehead and Nimrod was primarily the political figurehead. And the spiritual is actually more important because spiritual authority sits behind temporal authority to give it strength. So get the image in your mind of a woman riding on a beast. And now look at this monument which sits outside the Strasbourg building. And now look at this one outside the Brussels building. A woman riding a beast, specifically a bull, is actually one of the primary motifs for Europe and has appeared on stamps, phone cards and currency. We know that Nimrod or Baal was represented as a bull in ancient times, so here we have Baal and Asherah all over the stamps and currency and outside both parliament buildings. The prostitute and the beast, the false religious system riding in on the back of the false political system, the male and the female in one. The reason this logo was picked because in the Greek form of the mysteries, Asherah became known as Europa. So actually, the entire continent is named after Asherah. And in one story, Zeus saw this beautiful woman, ran into the ocean with her and raped her. After her death, she was then given the title, the Queen of Heaven, which we also know is a title Asherah uses. The European Union has three legislative branches, the European Commission, the European Council and the European Parliament. Most of the legislative power lies with the Commission and the Council. Both of these branches are completely undemocratic. Those on the commission are unelected and it is unaccountable to any electorate. It cannot be changed or removed by the people. When the commissioners are given their role, they take an oath to abandon any national allegiance. So effectively, it is run by an elite who can do what they like. And they are the ones who come up with the policies in the EU. The next branch down, the European Council is made up of the Prime Ministers and Presidents of Member States. While they have been elected by the people of their nation, they make decisions without consulting national parliaments and act effectively like elected dictators. People in Britain will remember Gordon Brown sneaking off to Lisbon to sign away our sovereignty and what was effectively a constitution without referring to the people because he knew that we would reject it if asked. He gave us no say in the matter and did it anyway. All these national leaders don't get to create policies, they only vote on policies handed down to them by the Commission, that is, the unelected elite at the top. The third branch, the European Parliament, is the only branch with any democratic principles at all, but it has very little power by comparison with the other two. Every year, countries hand over more and more of their national sovereignty to the centralised dictatorship. Here in Britain, we've had several examples recently of Europe imposing law changes on our country by people none of us voted for and who none of us know or want. Our politicians carry on regardless. 
As you can see, the stage is being set for the emergence of a global political system, a global economic system and a global religious system based on the mystery Babylon religion. But if the European Union will be the most powerful empire at the end of time, there is still a whole world out there to be brought into line. Another occult organisation has been tasked with that project, the United Nations.